we've been doing these town halls for a little while and fundamentally what we're trying to do is to um, think about the technology industry across different sectors and the way it affects real people. Uh, think about the impact of the various uh, technological innovations that are happening across the continent and whether we're prepared for them or not. Um, tech is increasingly changing the world. Um, and not just sort of in the West, but across Africa. Um, we've seen the impact of the telco sort of revolution over the last two decades across the continent. It's had big impacts in terms of fintech, in terms of our ability to move money. And increasingly, um, we're seeing it affect other areas. Um, I think Folawe's sort of introduction was interesting in talking about how it hasn't affected every sector equally. So for instance, when we look at fintech, we see tons of money coming into fintech. We see radical changes in the way we can move money in what it is that we can do. But across a range of different sectors, the impact is varying. So we've done health tech town halls, we've done mobility, we've done renewable energy town halls. And in each of these, we've looked at the impact of technology in each of these sectors and seen that it varies. Uh, mobility has been big this year. Um, incredible amounts of money going into that field. Uh, we've seen $50 million investment round. Um, this year alone, we've seen you know, $13 million, $8 million, and it's like, wow, like there's a lot of energy and activity going in that round. We've yet to see a $50 million investment in the ed tech space. But here they come. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Um, right, so this is not intended to be a, um, this session is not a prayer session. Um, we're going to look at the reality of this sector sort of like um, from a, sort of like the numbers perspective and look at what uh, the reality of the space is. Now, we know Africa has a learning crisis. I mean, most of you in this room are in the education sector, so you do know, you know, what is happening in this space. We know that 31% of students across the continent are out of school. Um, about 97.5 million uh, children. Um, we've got, um, despite sort of this progress in environment, um, we know that's actually a better rate than we had a decade or five years or 20 years ago uh, when many of our countries were at war um, and sort of our sort of uh, education rates weren't as high as they are right now. But despite increasing education rates, um, are people actually learning in these schools? Um, we know that um, sort of 10 to 12 million students enter the workforce without the required sort of like um, educational skills. Um, we are releasing 140 million people across the continent into the educational system who don't have an economic stake. They don't have the education, they don't have the skills that they require to actually participate meaningfully within the economy. Um, we know youth unemployment across the continent is remarkably high. And this sort of shows um, sort of a range of people who are well, vulnerable, um, but contributing to the economy, and then people who are making sort of some real wages. Versus people, 31%, who are not actively contributing to the economy, they're either unemployed and discouraged, or they're simply inactive. Um, they're just not doing anything. Um, they haven't been able to find jobs. They haven't... Uh, the skills that they need to sort of compete. Um, across Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, as uh, so it's kind of a dodgy um, measurement, but Sub-Saharan Africa, 6% um, of our employment is high-skilled employment. In the West, that's 24%. I mean, on a global basis, 24% of roles are high-skilled jobs, which means that you need better than, a, um, whether it's a degree, so you need better than a, secondary school degree, you need a university degree, or you need advanced training, um, skill training in some way or the other. The fact that we only have 6% of those across Africa um, is an indication of our productivity. Because if you don't have people with skills, then the kind of things that they can do are limited. Um, and this number doesn't actually give sort of like the full perspective. Um, if you think about automation, which is sort of one of the things that's frequently discussed in terms of the future of work, um, you'll see that we're successful to automation because if you're doing low-skilled jobs, if all your jobs are assembling, um, are basic low-skilled jobs, it's easier for them to be automated away. The jobs, um, as we heard in the video, the jobs of the future, the ones that are really, really difficult for automation 
to take away our jobs that require emotional intelligence, that require you to have managerial training, that require you to do complex tasks that a robot or a machine can't put together. We don't have many of those in Africa. Um, if you've employed people or you've worked across the continent, you know we don't have a lot of people who are able to do complex multifunctional tasks. Um, it's why people hire employees and they say, you will do this one thing. And there isn't much of an expectation that they will develop or improve beyond that. Um, and it's because the foundations aren't there. Um, so in Nigeria, 46% of the jobs that we have are automatable. You could basically, over time with technology, sort of like remove 46% of the population. 39% uh, of the core skills, uh, this is South Africa, looking at South Africa, um, the roles will change. What is a job will change. And if you know anything about the history of automation, you'll know this is what always happens. You know, Once upon a time, we had people called typewriters, and that was a job. Like, literally, someone's work was to, I will speak, and you will type. Over time, personal computing systems and word processors became so common, there was no longer a need for typewriters. And so, in the same way, in 10, 15 years, are we going to be looking for, I mean, some of the jobs even that we think are the jobs of the future may not necessarily be the most important jobs. Will we still be looking for coders in the same way that we're looking for them in 15 years? Maybe, maybe not, because coding will change. The things that you think are super specialized now, over time, will become more commonplace. And everybody will be able to do a certain aspect of this job themselves. Which means the expectation is that anybody that can pick up a computer should be able to do a little bit of their own coding. Or, um, and then if you think about that, then you wonder about like sort of even lower scale jobs that we have today. Um, across Africa, our readiness to adapt to these sort of changes are pretty low. Um, and that's what that map is. It shows sort of like the countries that aren't quite as ready to adapt to the future. Um, so let's talk about EdTech in Africa and just sort of this scene. Um, we see a scene that's growing. Um, these are a few sort of... Um, Ingini is um, an EdTech uh, incubator in South Africa and they're one of sort of... We've used them as a bit of an indication of what's happening across the continent because they call for entries. And they're seeing interest from across the continent. Uh, for, this star, for this event, we did a call for sort of startups in the ed tech space in Nigeria. And I believe, Larry, if you're here, correct me, we had 54 startups in this space, um, which is encouraging. Um, 54 startups um, means 54 sets of people working aggressively, and I'm sure we didn't capture all of them, working aggressively to sort of solve problems in the ed tech space. Um, Ingenie's incubator program is seeing sort of like applications across the continent um, increase year on year. So in 2017, 170 people applied. In 800, uh, 2018, 100, 800 people applied. Um, which, again, is, is indicative and is encouraging. It means more people care about this space. More people see potential for real solutions in this space. Um, and it means more people to sort of like crack on the key problems. Um, K-12 is a big focus of the EdTech uh, entrepreneurs. Um, you can see in there sort of there's adult tertiary people, about 20% of these EdTechs focusing on that space, about 30% focusing on tertiary, um, and almost 50% focusing on K-12 education, which is sort of early children, um, and then there's early child development with 3.5%. Um, K-12, obviously, sort of like the, well, in, here would be primary one to uh, SS3, is a core, core area of focus because that is where sort of the foundation of children's education is. Um, and it's encouraging to see that much activity in that space. Um, here in Nigeria, we see sort of growing interest. Like I said, 54 startups um, for this particular event. Um, in Gini, saw 252 uh, sort of applicants from Nigeria for their incubator, um, which, again, encouraging sort of progress in terms of interest in that space. Um, Okay. That being said, the amounts of money being invested in this space, they vary. Um, we're not seeing sort of like um, the, the, the same numbers, especially not in Nigeria, that we're seeing in sort of the fintech space. Um, but there is some sort of, um, in terms of 
companies that are valued um, pretty highly, UNICAF, Andela, the African Leadership Academy, Bridge Academies. Uh, some of these are ed tech, some of these are education, um, but those are sort of the more mature companies within this space. Um, it's still pretty thin. Um, it's still pretty thin compared to other industries. Okay. Um, something to note is that there's money going in. It's not enough. And in 2017 to 2018, we saw an interesting thing where it actually went down. So in 2017, um, EdTech funding um, totaled $65 million. Um, in 2018, it came to $31 million. So actually a 50% drop in that space. And so that sets one of the sort of challenges for the people in this room, uh, for the people interested in the edtech space, is the work is to tell your stories in interesting ways, is to be able to capture the opportunities and the challenges within uh, this industry in a way that's interesting for investors. Um, because investor interest follows opportunity. Um, and sort of that decline in funding is an indication that we're not telling the stories right. We're not sort of showcasing the problems and the potential of this industry sufficiently for investors to sort of uh, come into that space. Um, now, um, in terms of uh, that investments that actually happened, there's a core of it that's going to sort of big European companies based in Africa, um, which is a problem we see in other sectors, but not to this extent. Um, so again, the challenge uh, for us is Pretty, pretty steep. Um, I mentioned I've already talked through this decline in sort of funding from 2018, uh, 2017 to 2018, so I won't spend too much time. Um, I think it is encouraging that local investors are paying attention to this space. Um, that's always a good sign. Um, so from co-creation hub to Ingenie to Ventures Platform, we see quite a bit of interest in it, and I know that there's some companies here who already work with these startups, um, and it's gonna be critical, I think, over the next few years to prove the financial case for these startups, to build startups that have real impact on people, um, and to start to sort of showcase that this is a, spe a space um, that can really, really sort of like deliver for investors. Uh, this announcement, super interesting and super exciting, um, to have sort of an investor of Sim Shagaya's um, um, caliber in the ed tech space um, with you lesson um, is again a good sign for the industry. It's one of those things that sets up as a signpost. And we've seen this across sort of different tech subsectors is when you have sort of big players come in, pay attention, and really start to prove a case, it raises investor awareness of the space. It raises sort of the, the it raises the quality of information you have about whether that space works or not, what the key problems are in that space, what the future of that space is. So this is one that, um, if you follow us, we're going to be paying keen attention to. We'll interview the players, we'll tell you how they're doing, we'll tell you when things are going up, when things are going down, or when things are just straight. Um, but this, among other examples like Andela and the like, are sort of like really big sort of like ed tech plays to pay attention to over the new next few years. Um, and see how they're doing. Um, okay, I'm over time, so I'm going to go quickly through this. Um, I think you know some of these uh, ed tech startups which are helping sort of uh, young people build the skills that they need for the future. Again, a lot of focus on sort of like digital skills and uh, building people for a technology-enabled future. Um, big challenges across the industry. We've talked about funding. Um, Incubators are a critical element of the tech ecosystem. And one of the things that we haven't seen much of is sort of incubators and hubs focused on it. Um, I'm pleased that Anna uh, from Afri Labs is going to talk to us a little bit about the work they're doing in the ed tech space um, over the course of this event. So you'll get a sense to see what sort of, um, I mean, Afri Labs, uh, the biggest collection of hubs across Africa. Um, and so I think their work in that space should be interesting to hear about and to find out a bit more d difficult. Um, on education, I mean, across the globe and definitely across Africa, government is still the biggest spender. Um, are those resources being used in the right way? Are they being directed effectively? Um, probably not. <laughs> um, so some of the work that is there for us to do in this room is how do we work better with government? How do we work more effectively with government? Falawe of Teach for Nigeria, who spoke earlier, talked about this. They need to build effective relationships. They need to be asking the right questions of our partners, whether in the government sector or already in the education sector. You can't build an ed tech startup 
that's separate from the existing educational infrastructure. You have to have an understanding, you have to have relationships with those people in order to be effective at the work that you do. And that's a pretty big note for the startups in the room. Um, as you go about your work, are you building relationships with the more established players in the space, with the people who hold the big checkbooks? Are you understanding what it is that they're trying to do, where their successes are, where their problems are? If you're not doing that, it makes your chances of success pretty slim. Um, so yes. Um, Startups should play the long game. This work is not going to be quick. Um, there are some industries where you can build a company in three years, exit and move to the Bahamas. It's not going to happen in education. Um, and that's important to know and to understand. Um, and um, yeah, we need a bit of a sandbox. We need space for people to experiment, for people to try different things, um, and to start to sort of really test out different solutions. Um, so we've talked about some of these regulations. Uh, cross a dialogue between edtech and job providers. That's absolutely critical. Are you speaking with the people who will hire the students? Are the skills that you are creating the skills that people actually need? Um, are you engaging? Um, I think India does this a lot better than we do in Nigeria. An active dialogue between employers and the creators of education so that it is clear that what you're building is what the market needs. Um, we need to do a lot more of that. Um, we need government to spend more money and pay more attention to the ed tech sector. It's the 21st century. Um, we're going into 2020, third decade of this millennium. There's no way that we should still be using curriculums from the past millennium. We should be using curriculums that don't adequately take into account sort of ed tech in in the uh, conception. Um, I think for the most part, I've covered all of this. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope today is useful and interesting for you all. And um, I look forward to working with you um, all um, on the future of ed tech in Africa. <laughs>